Um, this is highly embarrassing, but I'm going to have to start off by saying I'm not a photographer. <laughs> and I'm not. I don't take photographs at all. Uh, almost religiously, I refuse to take photographs. Um, having said that, I've worked within sort of with photography for the last uh, 12 years, and it's kind of my big passion, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing I'd like to say is really nice talking at It's Nice That event, because I think I'm right in saying that It's Nice That founders were from a design background. Is that right? And I think it's really important um, to always think about like how design and photography are best friends, really. I mean, when talking about photography, and I, I'm really interested in this question, is, is do you ever not see, do you ever see ph photography, no, sorry, let me word it differently. You, you never see photography without it being in the hands of design, ever. Whether that's in a magazine or on a billboard advert or on the, you know, the screen of your iPhone or, you know, an, on a website, everything. Photography is always held by design, which I think is fascinating and I think sometimes that's sometimes forgotten. Anyway, that's a complete tangent. Um, so yeah, I'm not a photographer, but I am a publisher, and I publish uh, works that have photography at their heart. Um, I'd even go so far as, and this might be bad for the University of Westminster, where I teach, but I don't even know how interested in photography I am. Um, <laughs> I'm really interested in ideas and stories, and I find I'm incredibly lazy, and photography is an amazingly brilliant way of telling stories very quickly. That's why I guess it's used in advertising quite often, I'm assuming. Um, but anyway, so in 2011, myself and a guy called Ben Weaver, who's an art director, um, set up Here Press. Um, and we're a small uh, publisher of books um, that, use, that have photography at their heart, that are used in telling stories. And I'm, I'm going to show you three projects tonight that, um, that I'm quite interested by, that we've been working on. Um, Strangely, two of them are quite political, or could be seen as political, and we quite often get asked if, if we're like a political publisher, and I don't, I've, we've never really figured out the answer to that one, apart from like an incredibly pretentious answer, which is surely publishing is a political act, which I think it probably is. Anyway, um, the other thing I want to talk about is, is sometimes I find Photography, there's lots of conversations about photography and the art world, as in they're kind of opposing each other or they work with each other, and I just think it's incredibly boring to have that conversation. Whereas I quite like using the, um, an, an analogy of the music industry with the photography world, and I think it might help with this presentation to think of, so we're a publisher, but I think a nice analogy is we're a bit like an independent record label. That's how I see ourselves. And we... I guess w you could say that we make kind of prog books or kind of um, concept albums in book form. Um, when I'm not interested in making a greatest hits record, uh, sort of, you know, 20 of the best pictures by Irving Penn or someone like that. That just doesn't interest me at all. We'd really like to make, find projects that are really problematic and then try and make sense out of them. And that's kind of the, th the three I'm gonna show tonight, hopefully have that in there somewhere. Um, <coughs> So I've got a really bad cough. Um, this, is, this is some pictures by a guy called Ben Roberts, who's a young British photographer. Um, and I'll tell the story behind the work first, and then I'll talk about the, the publication side of it. Is uh, Ben Roberts, okay, you all know about the, the Occupied movement, obviously, that happened all over the world, but was quite interesting in London at St. Paul's and Finsbury Square. Anyway, Ben Roberts uh, was on a train down to Brighton one day and he, he's a slightly left-wing guy, I reckon. Um, and he, he was on this train, and he sat down, and next to him was a copy of The Telegraph. And he's not normally a Telegraph reader, I assume, Ben Roberts. And um, on the front page of The Telegraph, I don't know if you guys remember this story, that the Daily Mail and The Telegraph both ran it, was this thing about the occupied movement, and they were both reporting that actually they'd, they'd had helicopters fly over the occupied camps and had heat-sensitive cameras on them, and actually there wasn't anyone there. It was a bunch of middle-class kids that went and set up tents and then went home to mum and dad's house in Guildford or somewhere like that. And like, quite rightly, I think, Ben Roberts got off his seat, got off at the next stop and said, that is ridiculous and I need to do something about that. That is the most horrific Daily Mail story that there is. You know, there are people all over the world, in Brazil, in South Africa, you know, do it, making this movement that was really, really fascinating and is still really fascinating and, and important, I think. 
And so we thought of a way of like, I need, I need to do something about this. I need to sort of dispel that horrible Daily Mail myth that they were, they were setting up. Um, so he had a, it's just a very nice example of an incredibly simple project that is in, incredibly poignant, I think. Um, and he had this idea at the train station that he got off on on the way to Brighton and he turned around, got on a, the next train back to London and on the way he phoned the, the chief press officer for the, um, for the Occupied Movement, which is someone called something, Naomi Colvin, I think. Anyway, she, she happens to also, she was also the press officer for the Occupied Movement in London, was also the chief writer about Occupied for The Guardian, which is quite interesting. Um, and he said, look, I, I need access, I want to photograph, I need two nights, I need to photograph the tents of Occupy, and I need to photograph these individuals' tents and the communal tents, but I don't want anyone in them. So I want, I want to do a story essentially about how, of course, people are living in these tents, but how I'm going to do that is photograph these tents without any people in them. And I think, I, you know, we've had numerous conversations with Ben, but I think, I don't know if any of you go camping, but I think anyone that's ever been camping ever realizes that however tr hard you try to keep a camp, uh, a tent neat and tidy, it's not possible. You get so much crap in a tent, whatever you do. And so he, f he felt that by photographing the, the tents without any people in them, he could immediately prove that of course there's people at the occupied camps, which of course there were. So this is a series of pictures of the empty, empty tents of the occupied movement in London. And when I first saw these, I remember that it's very clever the way he sequenced these when he first showed them to me, is that if you have them, some of them are just incredibly abstract and you have no idea what you're looking at. You don't really understand that it's a tent and then some of, your, some of them are much more obvious. And also I think they're fascinating. You know, at that moment when I first saw these, I didn't quite know the scale of, the, of this kind of occupied exercise. You know, they had IT tents, they had hospital tents, library tents, um, religious tents with different kind of religious communities that were taking part in the movement. And so it felt incredibly important to make a publication about this, of, of this work, but also to make it affordable and on a kind of quite mass printed, you know, to print it en masse as it were, um, which sadly we couldn't do because we don't have that much money. But we made this publication called Occupied Spaces. Um, it was, it cost £12.50 in the shop, um, it was incredibly simple. It had a few quite nice design elements to it, where the, essentially the spine, which is where the essay is, which is an essay, something I feel very strongly about photography books is no one wants essays about the photography. That's the most incredibly boring thing in the world because surely the photograph should do that. So it was an essay by Naomi something. It's really embarrassing, I can't remember. Um, about the occupied movement and, and the situation it was at that time globally. Um, and I wanted to show this, this publication, because it's quite a kind of lo-fi thing, um, partly because it's done very well. So we printed a few hundred copies, because that's all we could afford at the time. Um, but it recently, I don't know, I don't know how photo booky nerdy people are in here, but there's, there's these books that have come out, there's been three so far by Martin Parr, the photographer, and Jerry Badger, the critic and photographer, called The History of the Photo Book. And they're very important, they really are the history of the photo book in terms of, sort of the last hundred years and so on. And um, in the latest one, this is featured as one of the most important uh, political books of the last 50 years, which I'm not saying it is, but they think it is, so that's great. Um, it also means that I always, I held back 50, well, I held back about 30 copies and I can sell these now for about 250 quid, which is great because originally it was 12 pound 50. And as soon as we knew it was gonna be in that book, we printed another 200 copies and sold them again for 12 pound 50. So we're all about, I want people to have access to the books, it's just whether I can afford to or not. Um, but I also, uh, sorry, I also thought I'd just talk about this book because there was a, going back to this idea of concept albums, I want to make the concept albums of books, is that everything has to be so considered. And there was something quite interesting in this, just as an anecdote about kind of sequencing, which was, um, they're all really interesting pictures, but I couldn't work out what the sequence would be. I mean, it, the easiest thing to do would be, well, that one looks quite nice next to that one, and that one's complicated, so let's put it next to a kind of more simple, a simple picture. But that just didn't seem really good enough. And then it was just, there was a very nice conversation one day when um, we were in the studio and Ben Roberts was there, and uh, we were just sort of talking about the camp and so on. And he was explaining the camp, and he was saying, um, 
oh, it's quite fascinating how it works. It's, it's, you have the, the sort of individual tents, the individual people's tents on the outskirts of the camp, and then as you walk into the middle of the camp, you go into the more communal tents, like the IT tent, the news tent, the press tent, blah, 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 blah. And then as you go out to the other side of the camp, it goes back into the sort of individual's tents. And that was, of course, like the sort of moment when we realized, well, that's how we edit the book. We must edit it as a map of the camp. So it starts, the book starts with the individual tent pictures and then goes into the communal ones. Then it has the essay in the middle that kind of acts like a spine, which may be a bit like a tent, maybe not, I don't know. And then communal tents and then back out to the individual tents. And it's always those things that probably no one will ever notice that, that that's how the book sequenced. But for me, it makes me very happy. So that was a, a really interesting moment. Um, and then I want to talk about this book, Control Order House, which I've been trying to figure out how to talk about this in such a short piece of time. This is a, a book by Edmund Clark that we did a year or two ago. And I, I don't know if I'm sure some of you are aware of um, what a control order is. They've actually changed their name now in the UK, but they're kind of still referred to as control orders. A control order is uh, something that the Home Office set up, which is, okay, I, I find it so hard to explain. If you're, if, if the Home Office suspects you of, terror, of terrorist activity, they can issue a control order on you, which means you will be put in one of, there's 43 of them around the country, one of these houses that is owned by the Home Office, um, and you have to be put in this house, it's normally very far away from your family and where you originally live, but it's a normally quite suburban house, um, a very normal house, and, and you have to, you have to sign a control order, basically, which, which is essentially, it's a bit like a tenancy agreement, basically, but a little bit more complicated, obviously. Um, and so, how, I just find it really hard to explain this. So basically, Edmund Clark managed to gain access to a house, one of these 43 houses that exist in the UK, where someone is being held under, uh, suspected of terrorist acti activity under a control order, which is insane that he got that access. Why on earth would the Home Office want an artist to be there? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Now, the other thing about control orders is they're incredibly sort of Kafka-esque. I mean, they're insane in, in what you have to sign, sign off to. So the other, another interesting thing about a control order is if, if you are suspected of, of terrorist activity and held under a control order, N neither you nor your lawyers are ever allowed to know what you're suspected of, okay? So you have to go to court and your lawyers have to, you know, represent you, but they don't know what you're suspected of at all, nothing. You have no information. And this exists in this country right now. Anyway, so Edmund Clark, who is basically the king of getting access to things, he managed, to, he got signed off from the Home Office three weeks to be in the house with a man suspected of terrorist activity living, living with him. And he wasn't allowed to, to show the man, but he was allowed to document the house. And after two days, the Home Office, obviously someone signed it off who wasn't the right person, because after two days, <laughs> after literally 48 hours, someone arrived at the door and took Edmund Clark, police escorted out of that house, and he was, they looked at all his photographs and actually let them have the photographs. But, um, but yeah, but, so he, he, he was actually in there, he was gonna make a film. And he came to us afterwards and, and he said, you know, I, I did this thing and it all messed up because I didn't have the access and blah, blah, blah. And I thought I'd be in there for three weeks, but I was only in there for 48 hours. And we were very interested. We're like, well, what have you got? You know, what did you do in those 48 hours? And he said I did something, you know, all I did is I had a, I had a camera, like a digital camera, and I just mapped out the house, like every single inch. He literally walked around the house, taking picture there, picture there, picture there, picture there. Like incredibly boring. Um, and we realized that this was actually quite interesting, this idea of control and mapping of something. And I should, sorry, sorry going back to the idea of what the, the guy who he was in the house with, who's referred to always legally as CE, and I don't know his real name, that's all he's referred to ever, and Edmund won't tell me, um, is he has to sign this control order, which is, like I said, it's like a tenancy agreement. So you're, and it literally, it's, it's amazing the, the, the detail in it, that it says in it, he's not allowed to drill into walls, He's not allowed to hang pictures. He's not allowed to redecorate the house. I'm sure that's not top of his priority. <laughs> but like, he's not allowed pets. He's not allowed to, I mean, it goes on and on, but then it gets slightly more complicated. Like, he is allowed out of the house at certain points, 
But if he bumps into someone he knows, he's not allowed to talk to them for more than three minutes. And it's literally this list, endless list of, of what is a control order, the contract, essentially the tenancy agreement he has to sign with the home office. Anyway, so, we, so basically we, came, we had this, pro, this kind of this problem solving idea is, so Edmund came to us with 542 of some of the most boring photographs you've ever seen in your life and one of the driest yet really important stories and endless legal documents. He had a control order, what you have to sign. He had his correspondence with the Home Office and then he had the court case because eventually CE did go to court um, and maybe I'll tell you about that later. And, and we, this, this book, you know, this, this funny little book took a year to make because we just couldn't work out how to do it. But the, the sort of m moment came much like the map, the mapping of the camp in the, in the occupied book is that we realize that we can't, we, it would be wrong to control this. I mean, partly because there's, there is like 542 of pictures like this, which are incredibly boring uh, and uninteresting and not very good pictures. I mean, they're just uninteresting completely. It's the moment came when we realized we just don't edit them. Let's just make a book of 542 pictures of inside this house and let's put every single legal document in there. So, I mean, if you want to look at the book later, I can show you. And there's, there's other, other elements to it. We got an architect from the pictures to design what he thought the house would make. And there are these pretty impenetrable legal documents, um, but, but they are worth a read. But then we also interspersed that with a kind of commentary. So if you didn't want to go into a 42-page legal document, you could just read the commentary that kind of sums it up because um, we wanted it accessible. Um, and then I wanted to talk about this book. So, okay, the other thing we did with this book, much like we tried to do with the Occupied book, is, is it's a really important issue, I think, anyway, personally. So we, we've made it as a downloadable PDF on the website. So you can download the book as a PDF form for free on the website, just because it's important to spread the word. And this book, I'm not, I'm, I've sworn that I'd never cost what the unit cost for this book cost, because it's got like seven different paper stocks and it's on all different fancy, what not, but it's incredibly bad way of making money printing books like that. Um, so anyway, normally, I don't know if, you, if, again, I don't know how nerdy you are about photo books or artist books, but like quite often there's this thing where people do a kind of artist edition of a book, which is where, you, you know, you sell the book in a nice box with a print. And I, I'm always really shied away from, from that kind of idea because to me it just looks like you're trying to make money which is why I don't make much money, because I kind of sneer at that, which I shouldn't, it's incredibly juvenile. But with this book, we decided to do a collector's edition, which comes in the black box with the elevation of the house. But the most important thing is I couldn't think, you know, we thought we'd do like an edition of 25, and they each come with five different prints, but what print do you want? I mean, they're the most boring pictures in the world. But then we came across this guy here, right? And in, it's just beautiful how this worked, but in five of the pictures, of these four, 542 pictures, this guy crops up. <laughs> and there he is down there. Okay, but you may laugh, but this is, this is really, really big news. This shows how absolutely Kafka-esque this is, is CE brought his cat with him, okay? And because he's got this cat, the Home Office obviously didn't see this when they went through Edmund's pictures, or they didn't care, maybe they didn't care. But because CE has this cat in this house, CE could now be charged fully with terrorist activity because he's got a cat, because he's broken his control order. So actually, suddenly doing a sort of special edition, so you, if you're interested, we've still got some for sale, you can choose which, which cat picture you want, and that comes with the book. Um, and then I'm going to kind of come full circle just to finish and talk, you know, I mentioned the music industry and like how that, I, I really like that idea of, you know, the books we make, I mean, Edmund's book was really like that tricky third record, do you know what I mean, that people talk about? Maybe not. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I want to talk to you about a book um, called Nirvana by Jason Lazarus, who's an American artist who uses photography, I guess. He kind of takes pictures, but he, he kind of uses pictures as well. Um, and he's a really interesting guy, Jason Lazarus, I think he's fantastic. Um, and, okay, to put it really simply, Jason Lazarus just asked the number of people that he knew, either online or in person, and he asked them the very simple question of, like, who introduced you to the band Nirvana? That's all he asked, right? And then I, I think what I'll do now is I'm just going to show you some pictures and read through 
read through the, the, the people in the pictures' comments about who introduced you to, Nirvana, to the band Nirvana. My daughter Caitlin introduced me. So these quotes I'm reading go with the pictures, right? Um, my daughter Caitlin introduced me to Nirvana. I took this picture of her in the Caribbean in 1994. In the week after this picture was taken, she broke her back and spent the next six years in rehabilitation. I remember clearly Cobain's voice as a soundtrack of this time when she lost so much. My uncle used to fly me out to Los Angeles as a kid. He was my early introduction to music, especially the Ramones and Joy Division. He paid me $100 to coat check at his parties as an eight-year-old. I listened to Nevermind with him for the first time, straight through at the kitchen table. I lost him to AIDS in 1994. Becky was my neurotic friend who had a stalker in high school and who came to her bedroom window repeatedly. While playing with the taser her mum brought her in her bedroom, Becky played me in Uturo all the way through soon after I bought it. Dave was my cover boyfriend at high school. He introduced me to Nirvana and mushrooms. He carved my name into his arm with a razor blade when I tried to break up with him. He also read me a love poem over the phone that I later recognized as a song from Dark Side of the Moon with my name inserted at significant moments. <laughs> Mickey, my mum's second husband, introduced me to Nirvana's Nevermind record. He was around until I was just 13. Philip introduced me to Nevermind in his bedroom in Vienna, Austria. He was my first boyfriend, and we were each other's first lover. Later, he told me that he kept the bedsheets from our first time. He died a few years ago in a tragic motorbike accident. Uh, and that's the book. And the book, actually, this is like a rough dummy of the book. It's not the actual thing. But I guess the big decision here was to take the text away from the pictures. And we kind of wanted to do it a bit like the pictures in the book become a bit like the songs and then the lyrics are on the back, you know, like you used to get on an old LP or, or on, on a CD or whatever. But I think that makes you spend more time with the book. Um, and yeah, I'll just say one more thing about that. What I love about this project is it's not about Nirvana. I couldn't care less about Nirvana. I really, really do have no interest. But everyone's got a Nirvana story. You know, I've got one. I'm not going to tell it now because it's desperately sad. But, um, <laughs> but uh, it's not about Nirvana. It's about growing up. It's about, you know, that first cigarette. It's about having sex for the first time. It's about losing someone for the first time. It's also like about American history, a certain moment. Well, not even American, but that book is particularly American. But, you know, you know with the AIDS, with the uncle dying of AIDS and all of this. And I just love that he, he found that device. Photography is really about idea. For me, the, the photography I'm interested in is just about ideas and about finding a device to explain a story. So Jason wanted to make a book about growing up. And so he asked people like, to tell him stories about Nirvana. Or Ben Roberts wanted to, you know, to, to make a comment about the Occupied movement. So he just took the people out of the pictures. When it, the Occupied movement's all about people. It's not about tents. It's about people. And Edmund Clark's book, I'm still working out what that one's about. Um, yeah, thank you very much.